6.30 on the dot. We try to be prompt here. Good evening and welcome. My name is Kate Markert and I'm executive director here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens in Washington, D.C. My pronouns are she and her. I am delighted to be with so many of you here at Hillwood, full house here at Hillwood, fantastic. And to be connecting with even more of you via Zoom. This was actually the highest um, prescri prescribed Zoom call we've ever had, so it's fantastic. Um, as I begin, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the Nakach Tank, also documented as the Anacostan, the Piscataway, and the Pamunkey, the native peoples on whose lands, Hillwood stands, and of course the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their homes near us today. Now, for those of you who are joining us by Zoom, please make yourselves comfortable. You probably already are. There are probably no shoes involved, as we know. Um, your cameras and microphones are not active. You submit your questions through the Q&A function in the Zoom menu when they cross your mind, and we'll get to as many of them as we can from both locations at the end. Now, for those of you in the theater, we ask that you keep your masks on at all times. We're a little close in here, although we're keeping one of the doors open to try to keep the air circulating. Um, those of us who are at the podium will be unmasked so that you can actually hear us. <laughs> And uh, you know the next thing I'm going to ask all of you are in the theater, right? Make sure your phones are silenced. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Hillwood's gardens are truly glorious now. I hope those of you who are here had the chance to, to romp through. There is a bounty of vibrant blooms, and I invite all of you who are in the D.C. area to come explore our gardens they have so much to offer this spring. They're just spectacular. If you're not already a member, of course now is a fabulous time to join and then you can stroll the gardens as much as you like and enjoy discounts on programs like this and also in the shop and the cafe. And I know you're shoppers, so, okay. <laughs> now, speaking of programs, we have some wonderful opportunities coming up this month. I hope that you'll all join me on Zoom, that's only virtual, next Thursday, May 12th, as Andrew Letty and Hillwood's chief curator, Wilfred Zeisler, explore the stories and impact behind the beautiful portrait of Lloyd Patterson that's currently on view in the mansion. And then at the end of this month, please join us on site or virtually for an evening benefit for Ukraine featuring classical and contemporary Ukrainian string chamber music, and that is on May 26th. So I hope you'll contribute. Um, all of the ticket sales and donations from this event will go to World Central Kitchen to those affected by the war in Ukraine. Neither Hillwood nor the musicians are taking anything at all, so all of your donations will go directly to a World Central Kitchen. Now it is my very great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Alexandre de Vogue. After a childhood spent in the Chateau, Vaux le Vicomte, and a few years in Paris for his business administration studies, Alexandre completed his military service in the Alpine troops based in the French Alps and went on to become a professional mountain guide. Alexandre spent 20 years traveling the world to climb mountains before he returned home, ready to face what he calls his family duty. In 2011, he entered the family company as communications and marketing director. He then became the director of development, creating the International Friends of Volevicomte Conservancy, a nonprofit in New York City. In recent years, Alexandre has taken on the responsibility for the collection of both the art and the archives of the Chateau. He set up a scientific committee as well as partnerships with museums and universities in France and abroad. 
Together with his brothers, he oversees an ongoing and ambitious restoration program, balancing a rigorous attention to historical preservation as well as cultural heritage. His newest book, Vol le Vicomte, A Private Invitation, is absolutely stunning, and of course, it's available upstairs in the gift shop. Alexandra will be delighted to sign copies at the desk just outside the theater following tonight's presentation. Alexandra, I am thrilled to have you here with us tonight. I'm still a little bit dizzy about the walk that I had with Kate in the garden. <laughs> I mean, so many colors, so much beauty in just a few minutes was amazing, amazing. I'm a little bit jealous because there's not much flowers at Volvicont. Um, anyway, so thank you, Kate. Thank you so much for this introduction. I'm, um, I'm very honored, very pleased uh, to be here tonight and to uh, have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the family home, Volvicont. And um, so I'll go through the history of 17th century, then I'll jump over a few generations, if you allow me, to go and tell you about my family, the modern, what I call the modern history of Volvicon, which is the family, uh, the end of 19th century uh, and beginning of 20th century. And then towards the adventure that we've been through with my brothers um, in keeping up with this estate, uh, having this privilege, uh, the ups and the downs, and, um, and then I'll be very happy, of course, to uh, answer any question you will have. That's the house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I'm just going to put my clock here just uh, to be on time. Um, oops, sorry. Yes. So I'm going to um, tell you, of course, about Volvicont, um, beginning with its creation. Its creation by this intelligent, flamboyant, ambitious, witty uh, collector um, and patron of the arts. This is a man whose legacy, because of the extraordinary events of his life, changed and shaped artistic taste, which still endure today. This is a man who had a vision to create the most beautiful house of France in order to serve his ambition and for the love he had for the arts. This man is Nicolas Fouquet. And, um, and the coat of arm of his family on the right tells us a lot about him. The squirrel is a Fouquet in the local Angers dialect where he was born in 1615. But don't get fooled. This is not, we're not talking here about the cute little animal who is climbing trees. No, this squirrel is very agile and has a massive ambition. His motto tells it all. Quonon ascendet, to which height shouldn't I climb? <laughs> But we will find that his journey will be far from simple. So we are now, this journey began in 1639 um, on this place. So we are strategically placed between Fontainebleau in the south, uh, at the south of Volvicomte and Paris. Why? Because Fouquet wants to be as close as possible to the royal power. That is his ambition. Um, and we know that, of course, the royal power is in Paris, especially in Vincennes, where Mazarin, the prime minister, is living in the outskirt, east outskirt of Paris, and Fontainebleau, where the kings are spending their summer. So he's going to inherit this land from his father, and uh, he is standing there in the middle of the fields, hills, rivers, and standing next to him is his great friend already, André Le Nôtre, the famous landscape designer. And he wants to have the insights and advice of André Le Nôtre regarding the future property. He definitely has this 
fantasy of having one day the most beautiful house ever. And he wants the advice of André Le Nôtre because he knows that considering the landscape, considering the land he's going to be soon the owner, he's going to be able to draw, to, to, to draw the main lines of the future estate. So the future estate is going to be built, imagined, by the best artists of Fouquet's time. We, some historians call them the dream team or the L team. We are talking about Louis Leveau, the architect, and there's no um, known portrait of Louis Leveau. André Le Nôtre in the middle that we just talked about, and Charles Lebrun, the painter decorator. And what Fouquet, I mean, he had, he had this, uh, this genius aspect where, yes, he took and chose the best artists of his time. Uh, they were not so well known. They were fairly, well, fairly known, uh, but not to the point that they were, of course, when they began to work with the king. Um, and, uh, and what he gave them is what any artist would dream of. First, a blank canvas of 1,200 acres. Second, a lot of money. <laughs> that helps. And third, freedom. Freedom to do whatever they could do, but they had to fulfill two conditions. First, that they have to work together, hands in hands, to a point where today it's difficult to know exactly who have done what. Um, so, uh, and then the second condition were that they had to be as bold and innovative as possible. Fouquet really wanted to break with the canons of Louis XIII that was already considered old-fashioned, and he wanted to impress the court, to impress his friends, to show his wealth, to show his taste. That was a way with Volvicomte to use Volvicomte as almost a propaganda tool to show to the world that he was this powerful man that was climbing ladder after ladder, the scale, the ladder, no, the uh, level after level, the, la the ladder of his profession. Um, he was barely 25 years old when he was at Volvicomte, I mean on the land with uh, André Le Nôtre, but he had such an amazing career that you know he had also <coughs> parallel to his career to prove that he was someone that everyone had to count on. Mm. So what they, what, what uh, Le Nôtre, Le Brun, Le Vaux created was this masterpiece of the 17th century that opened a new era in France. We are talking about the Grand Siècle, the first half of the 17th century, and uh, at Volvicomte with the garden, with the um, design of the architecture, with the decorative art, they open a new era by having those art put at the excellent, excellent top level of what was possible at this time. So here we have a few very small you know, details of the decoration, um, of the paintings, of our squirrel, look just here, <laughs> That is, um, that is a, a, a fleeting uh, close to a snake, and the snake being Colbert, an important uh, man um, that is part of our story. <laughs> so to begin with the story of Fouquet, Fouquet is close to uh, finishing the chateau. And in the 17th of August, 1661, he's throwing this lavish party at Volvicon to inaugurate the place, and this is the opportunity for him to invite the king and the court. This party has been extremely famous because it was one of the most beautiful parties of the century, but also because it really participated to the myth that really exists around the story of Nicolas Fouquet. The myth saying Nicolas Fouquet, extremely rich, uh, was the Minister of Finance under the young King Louis XIV because Mazarin wanted to appoint uh, Nicolas Fouquet as Minister of Finance to gratify him for his loyalty during the Fronde, during the civil war, where he was loyal to Mazarin, to uh, Anne of Austria, and to the very, very young king. 
And um, so he became uh, Minister of Finance. But then the myth says, you know, he took advantage of his position, stole some money in the treasurer of the state, build Volvicon thanks to this money, invite the king, and the king being so jealous in front of so much beauty, put him in prison for the rest of his life. <laughs> well, you think it's funny. That is dramatic. But anyway, this is, this is a myth. This is the myth. Let me tell you about the real story. And I was telling you about Colbert. Colbert is the man on the left, and the king, of course, Louis XIV, that I don't have to point out for you. Um, so what we are, what we're having in uh, 1961, March 1960, uh, sorry, 1661, Mazarin died. Mazarin was the prime minister. Who is going to be the next prime minister? Well, Nicolas Fouquet is the most powerful man in the, um, in the government. And then you have someone that was the personal assistant, we would say today, of Mazarin, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Both of them want to become the next prime minister. Mm -hmm. Except that uh, Fouquet is this flamboyant, again, charming uh, character. He is the most powerful person in the government. And he is way in advance in the race of becoming the next prime minister. So Jean-Baptiste Colbert is going to convince the king that Fouquet is the bad guy that Fouquet is stealing in the cash, in the treasure of the state, that Fouquet is raising an army to overthrow the king, and that Fouquet could be one of those powerful seigneurs, as we say in French, um, that tried to overthrow him during the Fronde, during the Civil War. And you have to remember that during the Fronde, he was 13 years old, the king, and the king had to flee the Louvre and to uh, go to Saint-Germain-en-Laye, this uh, old chateau that is destroyed since, uh, with no fireplace, no heating, no furniture, and he was traumatized. He has been traumatized by this episode of his life where he was only 13 years old. And suddenly when Fouquet, uh, Colbert tells him, be careful, you have someone that might be part of your enemies, he suddenly thought about this episode of his life and thought, what about if Colbert was right? What about if my friend uh, Fouquet, to whom I offer a whole forest, La Forêt de Guise, for his chateau. This, this chateau that I know because I've been already twice in the construction site of Volvicomte. What about if my great friend Fouquet was one of those um, powerful people that want me uh, away from the throne? So he's going to be convinced and put up a plot three months before the party in May 1661. Both of them are putting a plot to get rid of Fouquet. Mm. So they're going to uh, uh, decide for the date of the arrest of Nicolas Fouquet that will uh, take place in Nantes, barely three weeks after the party. They'll decide to um, name the judges of the, the future trial. They decide to uh, destroy some evidence, to change some evidence, just to overload the boat of Fouquet, as we say in French, you know, to make it as guilty as possible. Um, Fouquet is drunk in his own ambition. He is at the party. Even Madame de Sévigné, her very good friend, is putting a note, a little billet, in his pocket saying, be careful, Nicolas. Colbert wants you dead. You really have to be careful. He doesn't believe anyone. He's at his, the pinnacle of his career and nothing will change his mind, he will become prime minister. Well, to cut a long story short, Fouquet is going to be arrested on the 5th of September 1661, the day of uh, the birthday of Louis XIV. So Louis XIV is offering himself his own minister of finance. In the same time, he is putting a fist on the table saying to the, U to the whole of Europe, who is the boss, if I may say. Uh, he is beginning to put the, his personality as the absolute king on the table, being able to arrest his own minister of finance. What he's going to do soon after, he's going to take the same artist, Louis Levaux, Charles Lebrun, and André Le Nôtre, and begin to build Versailles. Why? Because I think the main lesson that the king learned from Fouquet was to use the art as propaganda, like the Medicis did. Well, he's not going to be different. 
he's going to use as Fouquet, show to the world that he was this powerful pe person because everybody was amazed by Volvicomte. Volvicomte, I mean, there was, it was a unique um, estate where you had so many fountains, so many you know, huge parterres that didn't exist before. Um, and those ceilings that were painted by Lebrun with um, Italian uh, artisans, with plafond à voussure, where you had suddenly, you were not only the beams, but you had the whole surface of the ceiling because of the voussure to be able to paint stories under the ceiling. This was really something that blew the mind of many, many people. And the, the king was going to do exactly the same thing at Versailles. Let me just here jump a few generations, and, um, and we are now in July 1875, and the chateau has been pretty much abandoned by the last family, the Choiseul Pralin, for 20 years or so. And, um, and the chateau is not in good state, especially the garden had completely disappeared, the garden of Le Nôtre. And um, there is this man who is another collector of art. And uh, one of his friends tells him, you know, this chateau is going to be sold at an auction. Surely, may, I mean, surely dismantled. But, you know, you, should, uh, you like old stones, you like art, you should uh, have a look at it. And this man is coming with his carriage along the Allée de Platane, a line with planes, and arrive in front of Volvicomte, enter the house, and fall in awe in front of those paintings, the Charles Lebrun painting that are still in quite state, uh, good state, and is considering the whole estate as a national treasure. And he, th he thinks to himself, well, it's a national treasure, one has to save it. He's going to buy the house at the, at the auction and dedicate the rest, of his the rest of his life and part of his fortune to pretty much resuscitate the whole estate. His man is Alfred Sommier, and he was my great-great-grandfather. So he made his fortune through the sugar industry by refining the sugar cane and then the beet. There was a lot of sugar beet in the area of Volvicomte. And he was going to decide to, to, to make Volvicomte a home again and to, sh to have his family at Volvicomte live on the estate for six to seven months a year. So he's going to begin to, uh, to restore the roof and to make the house livable, I would say. Um, and, of course, he was going also to um, take care about the garden. He's going to begin to ask his, um, his, his uh, architect, Hippolyte Détailleur, how he would be able to make alive again the spirit of André Le Nôtre's garden. And that was the state of the garden on the first part of the picture. That was the state of the garden when he bought the place. You could see that next to the chateau, close to the chateau, there's two parterres with shrubs around. That might be perhaps the first little restoration or restitution of the two most important parterres in front of the house. Um, so. It's more his son, Edme Sommier, my great-grandfather, who decided to hire the, some, archi some architect, this landscape architect called the Duchesne, Henri Duchesne, the father, and then Achille Duchesne, that, were became, that became really famous by being able to, re to, to create a sort of a revival of the French formal garden. And that's what they began with. That was the first. So that was the parterre that I was telling you about. Uh, close to the, the house. Then we are now in 1895, maybe 1900, and they began to restore the flower bed of Nicolas Fouquet here on the right, and then here what we call the mixed borders, which was very in fashion in, in, in England, and that was a way to square or to frame, I uh, better said, the, the parterre. Um, but then um, in 1907, this is what the parterre began, uh, became with the embroidery boxwood, not the one that exists, of course, at the time of Le Nôtre, but that is a creation of Achille Duchesne, um, but being hugely inspired by the parterre of, and the embroidery boxwood of Le Nôtre. I'll tell you more about those parterres later on. 
Um, what we have today is basically what Le Nôtre uh, and Fouquet had uh, almost 400 years ago. What changed is the epiderm, the skin of the garden. What didn't change is the structure of the garden. And how was that possible is that um, one of the landscape designers that was working with Achille, uh, with uh, Hippolyte Détailleur, the, the, landscape, the um, architect, knew that at the time, his name was Elie Lenné, um, and knew that at the time when the, the fashion of the French formal garden changed to the English garden, it was easier to add a few inches of soil on top of the existing garden and planting the garden on top of the last garden instead of ripping off the, the, the plants of the garden that we don't want anymore and plant again the, the new garden. So when he did that, he thought, what about studying the engraving that was part of the collection in the chateau and study exactly where would I found the masonry work? Because you know they've been adding some few some soil. So if I dig on precise elements of the estates where I can see on the engraving some stairs or some ramp or terrace, I should find the blueprint or the, the structure of the garden. And that's exactly what happened. So he found by digging on strategic places the the exact uh, structure of the garden of the 17th century. And today, when you're there. You know, all the optical illusions works absolutely perfectly to the centimeter, I would uh, say almost. Um, and that, of course, is a very simple proof that we are in front of the garden of the 17th century that Le Nôtre designed um, uh, 400 years before. So that was the work of the Sommier family. The Sommier family, my father always had this huge respect and admiration for them because he, he, was, he was saying they were not aristocrat. They, were, they built their own fortune through the, the sweat of their forehead. And uh, they didn't inherit it. And they saved Volvicomte. I mean, the people who really saved Volvicomte, it's the sommier. It's no one else. And, um, and I think we do still have this huge respect and memory of, um, of our ancestors. Then, my, so Edme, Alfred Sommier, my great-great-grandfather, he had four kids, and only one had children, Lucy, her daughter. Lucy Sommier got married with Robert de Vaugué, my great-grandfather. And that's how it went from the Sommier family to the Vaugué family. And then my father got married in 1967, and received the Chateau de Volvicomte as a wedding gift. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we still don't know if it's a exactly. gift or a burden. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. And um, so we are here in 19, oops, sorry, uh, 67, um, with my mother on the left. Uh, they got married, and you know, my grandfather, my grandfather said to my father, now it's your turn. And um, my father always, uh, not joked, actually didn't joke at all, but said to us, you know, at this time you didn't say no to your father. Um, so he, he is inheriting a huge estate, but not with the fortune that was existing in the 19th century. There have been some wars, there have been some uh, new tax and uh, inheritance. So the fortune is definitely has been shrinking um, and he is looking for some extra revenues. What he's going to do, he's going to look at England and how those aristocrat families uh, were dealing with their own chateau and their own family homes. And they were very good at opening their homes to the public, in the same time living in the same you know, chateau and outbuilding, etc. So my father decided in 1968, he is living in the chateau, he's living actually right on the uh, above his head on the right, on the, on the first floor, uh, in this apartment. I was born with my twin brother in 1968. We were using this uh, small apartment on the first floor and using the stately apartment on the ground floor as our living room, TV room, uh, dining room, etc. So suddenly, in March 1968, my father decided to open the house to the public. And that was one of the many family scandals that for go on still today. Um, 
uh, but yeah, he opened to the public, and we had to move, you know, the to hide the TV or to <laughs> clean the toys that were on the stately room to um, to uh, offer a proper 17th century, you know, decor to our visitors. So he began and he created the Volvicont of today, the modern Volvicont, the company. It is a corporation, um, and he is, I guess, the second person who saved Volvico, who saved Volvicont because it was, as you can imagine, a huge challenge to uh, be a family, to live in this huge house, and in the same time to be able to get some extra revenues, to be able to, um, to pay for the upkeep. This is the largest privately owned estate and classified as a historical monument in France. Um, it's not something that we are proud of, it just makes it the most costly <laughs> to, to maintain. Um, so what he did, he, both of my parents were really, and it's not me who says that, but a lot of the people in France that really acknowledge their vision about how to open a house, a historical house to the public, and in the same time being, you know, uh, imaginative enough to attract people, because, you know, there's a fierce competition, even more so today, but even at that time, you know, everyone wants to go to Versailles, everyone wants to go to, uh, then uh, Euro Disney, which is just one hour from there, um, to the mall, to the cinema, to everywhere but a chateau. And uh, yes, in the 60s, 70s, there was still this fashion of, I'll bring my kids to visit a chateau. Even though there, nothing would happen special, then it was not events, there were just a beautiful garden, a collection, and a chateau to visit. Uh, that was good enough to visit a chateau. Now, you do that, and you've got zero visitors. Um, you better be inventive. They began with the um, candidate evening. That is, if I, you haven't been, actually I didn't ask you at the beginning, and may I interrupt just a few seconds uh, my presentation. But how many of you have been to Volvicon already? I like that. <laughs> I like that. But I, what I like even more was the one that didn't raise their hands, you must come. You must come. And this is actually the most amazing experience that my father and mother had created some 35 years ago is to put 2,000 candles in the garden and on the rim of the every single uh, windows. Um, it's a very modest reminiscence of what was the Fouquet party of the 17th century. So, and there's an alfresco restaurant, and there's a champagne bar, and there's a firework at the end of the evening, and we do that every Saturday from May to October. I think this is the most um, um, very romantic and, and, and very simple. Uh, there's nothing else than, than candles and a beautiful place. Um, today, it is a company. To give you a few figures of what is Volvicon about, we're talking about an estate of 1,200 acres, a garden of, a French formal garden of 80 acres. Um, and I was telling Kate earlier on, uh, one of my favorite, um, most favorite figure is the number of gardeners. We have eight gardeners for this garden. We don't have much flowers. We have the flower bed on the left of the embroidery box with parterres. Um, and that is a huge enterprise for our small team, but they're very excited, they're very proud of working on this, on this flower bed. Um, there is an eight miles wall around the property, there's uh, six acres of roof, um, and uh, what else? And we are a company with 80 people, my brothers. So my father stepped back from the operations towards 2012. And, the th and we are three brothers. We are three brothers, and we decide, the three of us, here, there is a, you have a picture here. Um, uh, so we decide, the three of us, to come back to Volvicon, because my father didn't share anything with us. Like, he was an only child, and he didn't have the, um, he didn't have the, the, he was not used to share anything with anyone, basically. <laughs> um, and he said to us, you know, don't, don't even ask me to work here. You first go away to put up, to build up your experience, and maybe after you can come back and we'll see. And the first one who came back was my twin brother, Jean-Charles, the, in the middle. He's my fraternal. We really don't look alike <laughs> at all. Um, 
And he said to my father 20 years ago, you know, he had worked with um, Nike, the, the, com the American company, and he said, you know, I think I can help you by uh, selling Volvicon to tour operators uh, in France and abroad. And my father didn't really do those kind of sales work. And he said, OK, only one year, and then we'll see at the end of the year if I keep you. <laughs> um, he's still there. So, so I guess he, he did a, an OK job. Um, then I arrived uh, 11 years ago. Um, I, as Kate was saying, I, we, we had, the three of us had a, a very different lives and very different jobs. Uh, and then Ascanio, my younger brother on the left, came uh, seven years ago. And we all thought, you know, we were not, I don't think we thought much about Volvicon during our youth. Um, it's just that ar arriving at a certain age of, and being a little bit more mature, we thought, you know, this is a very, very special place. This is a place that belonged to the family for almost a century and a half. And this is a place where the entrepreneurial adventure must be absolutely fantastic, and I want to be part of it. So I think we, without talking to each other, uh, we had those three same uh, motivations. And at different part of our lives, we came back to Volvicont and to try to carry the torch as uh, my f our father didn't show us, but you know, we were talking about Volvicont all the time at the family table. Um, so so we, 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 we had, you know, Volvicont in a way were circulating in our vein in some ways. Um, so we tried to be as visionary as they were, uh, our parents. And for example, I'll give you a few examples to, of what we did. But this is, for example, we had many companies, startups, that came to Volvicont and tried to sell their app, their screens, their tablets to see the collection, etc. We didn't want any of them because we thought, you know, this is the number one, one of the most important challenges of parents today is to control this time of screen. So we didn't want the kids having, uh, arriving at Volvicon and having again a screen. <laughs> so what we did is that we, we record, we, we, we did the, uh, how do you say, we record, uh, enregistré? Record, record. The um, uh, voices of comedians um, in the chateau um, and telling the story of Fouquet. So a comedian that would play the role of Fouquet, Madame Fouquet, Colbert, La Fontaine, the king, etc. And then in a 3D binaural, don't ask me much about this, the technical, but it's an amazing sound where you really hear a whisper or the crack of the parquet or anything. So you're really immersed into this story and you have your hands free and you have your imagination uh, to imagine the scene because at each uh, room it triggers automatically the next part of the story. So this is something that we wanted to, because our objective is to share this place with the maximum number of people, but to share it in the most vivid way possible for our visitors to have an experience of what was the Grand Siècle about and what was the audacity of the people who made the Grand Siècle about. Those people made something unbelievable, extraordinary, and we would like our visitors to understand this boldness this audacity through maybe technology, maybe not, but technology today help us to tell the story. This is a restoration work that we just finished uh, at the end of last year. It's the Grand Salon, uh, the Grand Salon ceiling and the Grand Salon itself. So it's an oval room. It's the most strategic, I mean, the most impressive room with the, mo the largest features uh, dimensions in the chateau. And this is a sky that was painted in the 19th century um, uh, when the Choiseul Pralin were the owners. We reached the scaffold, with the scaffolding, we reached the base of the sky, and we suddenly realized that the sky was really done in an awful way. And we couldn't really realize that because we were looking at the sky from the ground, but suddenly with the scaffolding, we are faced with something that is not good at all. <laughs> And we have the term. The term here, there are 12, uh, sorry, 16 uh, statues that were 
sculpted under the drawings of Charles Le Brun himself. They are spectacular. They are of the finest uh, level of art that was done at this time. And suddenly we have this sky of the 19th century that is really um, not uh, putting them into, into light. So that was in July last year. And suddenly we realized that maybe the best option is to come back to the state of this cupola that was for 200 years white. Why? Because Charles Le Brun had a project of a fresco. Unfortunately, Fouquet got arrested right after the party. So what the fresco didn't exist, never existed. But my father always told us about this fresco and said, one day I would love to find a way to have this fresco painted on the cupola of Volvicourt again and to show the visitors what was going to become the cupola and the Grand Salon if Fouquet was still alive. Um, so we restore the, sh the, the, the cupola. Uh, we restored all the terms around uh, the, the Grand Salon. And so this is, these are the terms. And, and, and uh, there, so this is not restored on the left. It is restored on the right. Those drawings, there are some drawings uh, a la sanguine, you know, the, the, the reddish uh, draw drawing of Charles Lebrun that are kept at the Louvre. They are fantastic. And we use them in order to be as close as possible to the reality when we restore those uh, trophées. It's called trophées that we have above each windows. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the fresco. So what we did here is this is a montage. But if you are coming after the 23rd of May, you'll see <laughs> the fresco of Le Brun that we are projecting onto the cupola. And we even went a little bit further by playing, because it's just a projection with 26 projectors that are around the, the, um, the Grand Salon. We ask, with the scientific committee, we ask them to find the colors that would, be, that would have been chosen by Le Brun if he had painted this fresco. And we did, we put some colors into this engraving because we don't have any colors. All, the, all the, the archives that we have are preparatory drawings from Le Brun that are at the Louvre. And we have this engraving made by Girard Audran in 1681. So we don't have colors, but we wanted to play. Some curators don't like it. We don't care. <laughs> we like it. We like it and we try. We hope that our visitors will like it. It's just, if it's, it's the most ephemeral way of restitution of, a, of a art because it's projection. So you, you push on and off and you don't have the colors anymore. Um, so that, is, that was something that was very exciting to go through and to be part of the adventure that I was telling you about. This was less um, of an exciting project uh, because we were talking here about the embroidery boxwood that were created by Achille Duchesne at the beginning of the 20th century. 2018, the box blight is fierce, is attacking the, bo the, 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 the boxwood. This is the state that we have at the end of 2018. We have a scientific committee that is telling us you cannot maintain those boxwood alive anymore with fair means. So we decided to remove all the boxwood. And that was, that was really horrible. I mean, you have to understand that we live in the outbuildings that are just here behind. And we've been living with those boxwood in front of our windows for ever. And suddenly, you know, in one afternoon, no more boxwood. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, this is, this is a life and death of a garden. And a garden is a, is a, is a, a live monument. And plants, we're talking about plants, living species. One day they die. It's not such a drama. We, we were, <laughs> no, but we were, we were very sad and, and traumatized, but you know, we don't have time to be sad and traumatized. We had to think, what next? Because you know, the visitors, that is being taken in January 2019. Six months later, we were opening the, the, the garden to the visitors. Mm -hmm. So we scratched our head and thought, what are we going to do? And one of the scientific community members said, what about a contemporary art piece? And we thought, contemporary art, Ugh, this is <laughs> vulgar. You know, uh, Versailles does that, we don't, we don't. And, but you know, at the end, and even my father, 
was thinking, why not? Let's, let's go for the adventure. And we had um, a jury, and we received many, many projects. And, um, and the one project from uh, the French artist Patrick Urcat got on the first round and then the second round the unanimity, unanimity of the jury. And this is the ephemeral ribbons. So we put the loan uh, 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 of grass, and then he designed, he designed, he took the main line on the left and put it into aluminum in order to reflect the sky. And you know, the reflection as the water, etc., is huge in a Le Nôtre garden and in French Fumal garden. So this is the um, different um, views of the ephemeral ribbons that we are very, very happy with. The, the, the main, the main um, um, uh, positive, uh, how do you say, uh, compliment that we have is it looks it's been there forever. Mm. And, and that is exactly what we wanted. And that was it, the, the two lines of the cahier des charges, uh, the, 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 what we sent to the, to the artist was, you are in a French formal garden, in a pioneering work of French formal garden, please invent whatever you want, but be respectful with the garden mm -hmm. and with where you are. And this artist, Fran uh, Patrick Urcad, I think had the intelligence to step back, you know, with put his ego at the back of his pocket, step back as an artist, and put forward the, the, the genius work of the 17th century, and just put something very discreet and very elegant. Um, I shouldn't say that myself, but I think that's what people say, I mean, think. <laughs> Um, the next huge project is the fountains restoration. We have an amazing uh, hydraulic system, which is from the 17th century, which works on gravity. So what we have at both ends of the garden is two high points where we have a reservoir. And thanks to the gravity, because the state is slightly lower, we have the pressure enough to feed the fountain, except that those um, <clears throat> those fountains, those reservoirs, when you open them, you have six to eight hours of water feeding all the fountain. After, no more water, and depending on the weather, because those reservoirs are fed by the, water, by the rain and by springs, it takes from six to ten days to refill the reservoir. What we want is to offer our visitors fountains that are functioning every day and even every evening during the candidate evening. It will really change drastically the experience of the garden. There's going to be a before and an after this project. This is a project that has been, um, uh, it's one of the two main fountains. They've been restored thanks to an American donor. I have to uh, say thank you to Marina. Um, and they've been restored last, uh, no, the, the, the year of the COVID, 2020. Um, they are part of the project, but it's a long-term project, and we're very excited about that. I just wanted to tell you one episode within, be between my brothers and I, um, because I think it's important to tell you the true story with, the, with something that we are very excited and proud of, and some other things that we were not that excited and that proud of, is that when my second brother came in 2015, for some reasons, you know, t working within a family, it's not sometimes easy. And what happened is that some issues of the old, our younger adult life step, I mean, came back up to the surface. Mm -hmm. And suddenly some brothers had some big issues that they were uh, expressing during um, meetings with the staff. And, um, and I, I, we could tell like that it was, it was not good, and, but not to the extent that two board members told us it was. They uh, asked us to come for a meeting in one of their office in Paris, and they said, you know, if you begin, if you continue like this, you might put Volvicont into the wall in less time than you think. You have to do something about your behavior, about your way, the way you are working together. So we went down to, um, to a cafe, 
and we had a beer. And, um, and one of my brothers said, uh, we won't be able to work that out without some help from the outside. And his wife had just uh, began a, a new career. She was a lawyer, but she became a coach. And he said, what about having a coach that would help us? At that time, I didn't even know what was a coach, <laughs> who was a coach. And, uh, and uh, we had a coach. Uh, that worked with us for nine months and that really taught us how to communicate between each other, how to listen to each other, and how to um, put up some professional, efficient uh, business meeting and to respect each other. And, um, and from that time, I'm not going to tell you that we don't have issues, uh, but it works more or less works well. So yes, we are at a very privileged place at Volvicomte. We, we measure the privilege that we have every day of being able to live on the premises and to design the optimum future of this place. But it is a very fragile uh, balance. It's, it's very fragile in between how we can cope between our, the brothers how we can cope with those crises that we have now, it looks like regularly, um, the competition that exists, but we have the immense privilege to have, to be in charge of one of the most beautiful places in France or maybe in Europe that gives inspiration to so many other places. So we try to remember how privileged we are. We try to remember what Fouquet, why Fouquet did this place, First, because he was a lover of the art. So let's be a lover of the beauty, of the harmony, of the right proportion that exists in this estate. And let's try again and again to be as bold, innovative as possible as they were 400 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander. My name, my name is Erin Lurie, and as we move into the question and answer period, I have the honor of representing questions submitted from our many friends joining us by Zoom. Alexander is going to call on those of you who are in the theater at Hillwood. We do ask you to wait for one of the wireless microphones that my colleagues Ed Vreeland and Sule Kin will be running around the room so that everyone, both near and far, can hear as you ask your question. Um, so I will let folks in the theater start raising their hands and kick us off at the same time with a question from Vanessa, who uh, wondered if you could talk at all about any government funding or um, foundations that have been supporting the restoration or preservation. OK, so the government funding is small, is ridiculously small, but it's getting better. So uh, you have to understand that in France, a private estate such as Volvicomte is funded 95% by, I mean, 50% by the visitors. Then um, I would say one third between, not one third, a little bit less than one third between the restaurant, the gift shop, and the private events. And then we have the private funding that I'm in charge, the development. And that is coming, the money is coming half from France and half from America. Because I learned my aunt is American, uh, well, married an American, and she was in charge of the development, of the, fu the, 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 uh, the fundraising of the New York City Ballet. And she was telling my parents, when are you going to put up an international or an American friend of Volvicomte? And my parents said, how could I, I mean, we lived in the house, how could I beg? kind of. Uh, so they were not part of this generation. And they didn't understand the philanthropy that is here in America. And when I arrived, my aunt said, now it's your turn. And I began to travel in the States, and I absolutely loved it. And I loved it because I learned so much. And I learned so much about how to manage uh, um, a museum or a botanical garden. Because you are, guys, so professional. You are so professional. We are Latin. We are more, you know, <laughs> it's going to be okay. You are, 
focus. And I learned, we learned so much, so thank you. But anyway, private funding, it's 15% of the budget. And uh, the subsidies are today 6% of the budget. And the budget is 8.5 millions of euros. And it's break even. So we break even, which is, you know, for the last four years, we break even except that we put only 1 to 1.5 millions of euros of restoration work every year. But we know, and we are doing a master plan, these, uh, we are finishing in September, uh, we know that we going we have to put much more than 1.5 million so we have we break even but we have to raise our revenues everywhere thank you i'll keep it simple how long does it take for your gardeners to cut the grass <laughs> <laughs> i can tell you that myself because you know why during the covid we put everyone except two guard in the chateau, but everyone in, in furloughed, uh, no gardeners. So my uh, older, uh, how do you care, uh, not niece, but uh, nephew, older nephew, my brother and I, we cut the lawn for weeks and weeks. <laughs> there are 13, uh, so there's 28 acres of lawn. So it takes days and days <laughs> and days. <laughs> oh, there is someone else that has a microphone? Uh, my question was actually, was there any damage to the chateau during the war? No. Thanks God, we were very lucky. We were very lucky. During the Second World War, there have been a lot of bomb uh, around the chateau and in the, in the park, and we can see still the crater. Um, during, so it was, um, it was a German center of command during the Second World War. And to give you a little anecdote, they, the first thing they, did was to put up a Nazi flag at the top of the roof. And my great aunt asked them that it was, asked them to remove it, and they did. Wow. They did. So they, was, they were quite respectful. They didn't damage anything. Um, and uh, I mean, it was a traumatizing experience, but they, they didn't damage anything. So, and during the First World War, uh, my great aunt became a nurse and put up a hospital that uh, cured 1,200 soldiers because the front of the war was so close. Um, so that was mainly the two activities during those two wars. Yeah, but we were very lucky. Chateau, we were very lucky. Uh, what is your biggest challenge, and how do you market this to tourists? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Very difficult, actually. Um, I think the biggest challenge is to, to raise the awareness of what is Volvicont about. And we know that we're not going to compete with the same client, guests, or visitors that Versailles. You go to Versailles, not you, but many people go to Versailles to tick the box. I made Versailles. J'ai fait Versailles. You don't go to Volvicont because, you know, you go back to your office and you say to your assistant, I went to Volvicont, and they say, you went to where? <laughs> so, you know, you don't think the box. So I think the biggest challenge for us is to raise aw the awareness among the maximum number of people of what is really Volvicont about, how, uh, how spectacular, how unique, and how much is a masterpiece. And then to be able to do that, being confronted to the huge competition that there is today. And we are competing with people that are extremely intelligent in marketing, in publicity, in communication. And we are just three brothers that might not be the most intelligent and <laughs> most competent people on earth, but we think that we have the legitimacy to be able to work there and to make this place known and I mean abroad and that people come. It's not an easy task, I'm telling you. It's not an easy task. And, and you know, meeting CEOs of institution here in America, as I was telling you, was, is such an eye-open experience. 
it's it's fantastic what we can learn from America. F absolutely fantastic. There are fantastic CEOs in France, but you know, place like this, there is only one. That means such an enormous, huge place, historic and private. People, after three hours of visit, still wonder: Is this private? I cannot believe it belongs to a family. It be it does belong to a family, and there is a corporation. We have to act as professional as possible. Um, it is it is a journey. We are on this journey, and I'm telling you, it's not easy. But I hope we will, the three of us, understand exactly what is our main challenge. Uh, we know what is what it what it is. We don't know yet how to transform this challenge into something that is worth this place because this place is intimidating. We are com we are facing one of the most beautiful places ever, and sometimes as brothers we are shy and intimidated, and we don't know if what we do is the right decision or not, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But today we can be proud, I think, that we respect the place and we respect the work of our ancestors. But today, and from today on, the world is fierce, the competition is hard, and we have to be better at what we do. So there is many hands, but I think the microphone is over there. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to meet you today, um, tonight. Um, there is a feature in the castle that I really, really wanted to see tonight, but um, there was so many of it. <laughs> uh, I am very, very happy. Um, I love the Hercules, that statue that is on the complete other side of the castle that has been. I wanted to know if this statue that was is all gold, right? Um, is this statue was uh, supposed to be there? Is this statue is the one that was made for the for the space? Mm. No. Uh, what is the story about this? Because it's fabulous. Like you can see it through the castle. It is a line. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's quite fantastic. Thank you very much for this question. And I'm sorry that I didn't show Hercules, <laughs> and it's uh, is worth showing. So this statue is actually. On the, there's a map of uh, Le Nôtre, that Le Nôtre design of the garden of Volvicomte. And on this map, there is a very tiny point that we can see also on the engra on engraving of the 17th century by Israel Silvestre. And again, we can see a tiny point, but on, on the engraving, you can, with a magnifier loop, that's what my great great grandfather did because it was not there in the 17th century. It was planned as it was designed on the engraving, but because of the arrest of Nicolas Fouquet, no time to do it. My great great grandfather studied with a magnifier um, the engraving, guessed that the profile of the Hercules was the famous profile of the, Far uh, the Farnese Hercules, Hercules. So he thought, okay, I'm going to put it. And he's going, he, was, he put some models. Uh, wood models to try to see what was the best scale in order to feature and being the point of convergence of all the uh, the perspective lines and um, and he made it cast in 1891 he made it he brought up I mean I think the story tells that there was a carriage with 26 horses that carry it's 13 so 13 meters is 12 foot it's, it's almost 50 feet high. It's the second highest aircraft in the world, and it has been regilded and restored recently by the same lady that I was telling you about. Um, so yeah, it is from the 19th century. But it is, it is essential to understand Volvicomte, which is the intricacy between the garden and the house. And when you are on the north side of the house, you see the three arcades that are empty. And in the central arcade, you see, despite the distance of more than one kilometer away, the statue of, the st of, of Hercules that is framed perfectly on the central arcade. You must come back or come to see that <laughs> because it's quite well, something. And 
I'm going to interject there because yeah. that is a perfect segue to the three questions from Zoom that I'm going to do my best to weave into our one final question. Um, and that is, Rosemary wants to know how you reserve an in-person visit. Jan is hoping she can take a hot air balloon ride over the estate. And I believe Sandra is hoping that some of your outbuildings are available for Airbnb rentals. Any, is there any question in there? How do we come and stay at the Airbnb and fly our hot air balloons and just come and see all the rest of the estate that it has to offer? Well, you know, there is, there's been a competition long time ago of Air Balloon uh, at Volvicon, launched on the last uh, loan between, before Hercules. The Airbnb, we are thinking about something. Not in the chateau, not in the outbuildings. <laughs> Volvicon is too precious for that. V uh, Versailles did a hotel inside Versailles. Chambord did a hotel inside Chambord. We are not going to put a hotel inside Volvicon. That tells you the difference between those places and Volvicon. Um, but I hope that it will be a reality outside, right outside the wall, we are thinking about some projects. 